let's talk about multimodal alignment. But just uh, before I need to wrap up the fine grain fission, so I will just give a quick uh, overview on that. And then we'll talk about two of the three sub challenge in alignment. So fine grain fission, like just remember fission, we talk a lot about modality factorization, like what is unique to one modality, what is unique to another, or what is joint, like the mutual information. But there's also another line, the set, related line, which is saying, hey, when you do fusion, there may be more than one way that information could be aggregated, like because there is maybe more than one way the modalities interact with each other. And can you like, in a sense, find those different groups of fusion. It's like multiple fusion. You could almost say it's multiple heads of a fusion uh, in a sense. And so how to automatically discover those kind of internal clusters or factors on how uh, modalities are interacting with each other. And I'm just gonna give you one example. I will say this is an area, another area where we think there's a lot more to be done and you should think about maybe extensions in that direction. But I just want to give one example. And this one will be based on a CNN-based approach. Um, sometimes those CNNs are a little bit more interpretable or easier to work with than transformers. Um, so I, at least I find them more intuitive. So if you remember, when you have an image and you run it through multiple layers of convolution, as you run it through the convolution, these response maps, these response maps that you get at different uh, at different stages uh, in the convolution layer, they do keep some spatial information. It's not as we talk about. It's not like full translation invariant. You do keep some local information because you run the the kernel on the image. You do get the response on the image. And so you do get some uh, information about what are like locally the, the kernel. These are the different kernels. And so you, for each kernel, you have a response map. So what's interesting and the observation there is to say, hey, for different objects, I'm gonna have locally, uh, especially for that object, I'm gonna have a signature of different feature map. And that's gonna be the same for the audio. And the audio, if you run it to a CNN, um, and it's a little bit debatable running it on a 2D CNN, but let's accept that for now. You, and then what they will do, and that was really interesting, so they will look at co-occurrence of activation. So you have some visually, imagine that you have pair data because you know that this image happened with this audio clip. So you have pair data, and there are moments when this region of the face will always be highlighted with this region in the audio clip. So you will be looking for co-occurrence of both of them locally being activated at the same time. So this is what they call uh, a shared or co-clustering. So you could do just on one side, just clustering. Clustering on one modality would mean take all of my images and look at which region are uh, uh, highlighted, uh, co uh, highlighted in general. But here you're gonna look at co-clustering. So you're clustering your data. You could cluster separately, like here, here is our, like the 20 different regions that I see highlighted at different places. So this is separately and you could do it separately, but because you have paired information, you can also build those co-clusters, those association between, hey, every time I see a baby, I hear crying. Okay, maybe because my daughter is two years old, that's an association I know quite well. Um, so yes, you hear different, or oh, laughing, which is also something you associate very much. So laughing and baby and playing. So maybe it's a mix of two things. If you have a baby and playing, they're laughing. If they don't have their toy, then there's a different noise here you will hear. So these association between uh, different objects and different sound will be learned through that. And so you get those clusters and these really what they're learning are those correspondence, the correspondence between certain uh, sound 
and certain object in the image. And then where, how do you represent an image? If you get an image and it's audited, you say, how much of this cluster is present in this? How much of this cluster is present in this? How much of this cluster? So that's become kind of a dictionary, a dictionary of like, oh, baby with a toy laughing. That's one uh, entry in my dictionary. Baby and no toys and, and crying. That's another entry in my a dictionary, and then given a new image, I start uh, encoding it by saying how much, how close, or how similar it is to each to any of those uh, entry in my dictionary. So then, at the end, when you are encoding something, you're encoding to these different dictionary or different clusters of fusion, different ways you can fuse information. So I invite you to look more in the details. This is what, just to give you an example of fusion. Um, but we talk a lot about fusion, bringing the information together, about coordinating. We also talk about uh, coordination function and contrastive learning and fusion, where we talk about information theory and mutual information. But now we're gonna go the next step because you remember representation was in fact local representation. That was the easy one. That was supposed to be the easy one. It's like two elements, one from each modality, kind of ignoring that you have a lot of elements. So the alignment is going the next step and it's saying, hey, it's not just one element from one modality and another element like a phrase and an object. No, now I have many objects and I have many words and I want to aggregate and I want to bring that information, synchronize that information. So the alignment is about identifying those connections between modalities. And there is at least three challenges. And by the way, these are brand new three sub challenges that were not even the survey paper. So in the last week, when we told you that the survey paper was a better version, this is an example because this is brand new taxonomy live that you're getting, uh, rolling of the drums. Uh, but yeah, so as the first one is the discrete alignment, which was kind of called connections before, where you do alignment between discrete elements. So this can only work if a modality has that natural way of defining elements like concrete, like concretely. So an, an image may be ambiguous, but if I decide to think of an image as a list of objects, then yes, I have discrete elements in it. But if I look at it at pixel, it's, it's a little bit more ambiguous where the elements are. So this is why there's the continuous alignment when, when, when this up use nice alignment elements are not there, but if you have like say a speech signal where it's not always clear the start and, and time of a unit or an element, uh, or even in an image, if you decide to use it at that more like fine grained pixel, it's not always as, as clear. And finally is, is like once you've done the alignment, either discrete or continuous or both, then you want to take that information and bring back what we learned in the previous challenge of local, but now it's about learning representation over structured data, like contextualizing. So it's no more like, like if you think about the previous challenge, it's no more about just one word, but it's about a sentence. So really contextualize the meaning of the word depends on the other words. The meaning of an object depends on the other object. The meaning of the object depends on the other object and all the words together. So that's really the multimodal one. So this one, and yes, the punchline transformers are gonna be around that uh, as one of the approach very popular for, for this. But today we, we will focus on those two. Uh, specifically, let's start with discrete alignment. So you wanna identify and model the connections between elements of two modalities. And we, we, we discussed that a little bit, um, but uh, here we're gonna kind of see it as a spectrum of approaches. Some of the approaches, although you're trying to take all these elements and trying to align and connect them, you can look at it as just like two at the time. I'm just like trying two at the time. Are these two connected or not? Okay, and yes, this approach here 
will be a little bit closer to lo local representation of the challenge one, okay? While here in the global alignment, you're really trying to align, taking in consideration all the other elements in each modality. Um, another thing to think about is when you do the alignment, is it like, am I aligning from one modality towards the other, kind of almost of a translation of like a directed, am I really aligning from one? Or am I really thinking about it as just like, are these two elements close to each other? Um, so one would be directed and one would be undirected. Uh, and we'll discuss both kinds. We'll start with the undirected at first. So why should two elements be connected with each other? Why should they be? We talked about it uh, in the first lecture. It could be because of something more statistical. What does it mean, statistical? By now, you should have a better idea. We talk about it uh, on Tuesday. Statistical mean that they may be like co-occurring or correlated. They're like co-occurring or correlated. Why semantically will mean like some kind of human uh, knowledge that uh, gives it a meaning and because they have similar meanings uh, uh, as uh, uh, accepted by a certain culture or certain language or certain way of communicating. So let's say English uh, or a human uh, uh, species. Um, so here will be kind of in a sense more bottom up. Statistical meaning is just that they co-occur, they were next to each other. We don't know if they really mean the same thing, but we've seen it so often co-occurring at the same time. They must be related in somehow. While semantically is like, okay, I established that this is a remote and a remote is, is something we keep in your hand. So there's a relationship because of that. Um, so the association is more related to the correlation of co-occurrence but correspondence like the image of a laptop or the word laptop. So the word laptop, why did we establish that the word laptop is the same as this? This is really established like a top-down knowledge established as a culture, as the language um, is established. So, and there is association and dependency or relationship if we look at it in a semantic way. So for now, we will, uh, these two like dependency and relationship we will discuss them more in the reasoning challenge. We will discuss more of that. We'll, we, some of the work we do will have a little bit, but what we'll focus primarily on right now are uh, this aspect of correspondence. Finding in my two modalities, correspondence or correlation or co-occurrence of my data. That will be the primary goal of, of, of alignment for now. And so one of the, uh, landmark uh, research topic is uh, language grounding, um, and you could uh, um, you could uh, define it as tying language like words or, or noun phrases uh, or, or full phrase or sentence um, to non linguistic elements. So you, um, I just said earlier, like the remote and. and I did a motion, you, you probably looked at, at the remote. I'm not talking about any remote, I'm talking about this remote. So I'm really grounding, I'm linking my word. When I say the remote later, you will not think of another object, you will know that this is exactly the object I'm talking about. So this is the linking towards the environment. It is often in multimodal in these days, at least in the research and language and vision, the grounding is often related to vision modality, but grounding doesn't need to be that. Like, uh, I mean, that sound that I heard, okay? I, I'm, I'm grounding it to another modality uh, or that taste of that, uh, that, of that dish that was really good um, that I'm grounding with another modality. So the grounding in general can be language with any modality, but originally grounding was a linguistic concept. So uh, now these days we hear object being grounded with sound, okay? But this is not how the word were meant originally. The linguists, when they use it, they really meant language, words or phrases being grounded or connected to that. But in research papers these days, if you see, almost people start using the word grounding as an anonymous uh, or a synonym um, 
to uh, like connection or linking or any kind of syncing. So it just it just took from the linguistic, but originally it was really about the language. And and it was grounding was meant in two ways. And I and 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 I will say it's important. One is to know what is connected with my words, but also more importantly, how is that connection changing the meaning of my words? So it, it's 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 identifying and also modeling or representing as well. So, but the first step is to identify. So let's say try to identify. So a woman reading newspaper, we can identify the objects and the link between the object and the words in this case. So how do we do, uh, what is the simplest? Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, 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 uh, to solve grounding, you can either look at, try to solve it statistically or semantically. You, you can do both. Um, so there's, a, there's nothing that stops you from those. Uh, without being a complete requirement, let me share the usual way. Um, usually, you will end up relying primarily on statistically because you don't have labels. Um, because the, or you have only weak labels. And, and so you're going to take advantage of co-occurrence as a way to approximate that thing. Uh, often the semantic is because you have some kind of top-down information, often labeled data that tells you that these are linked. And so you will take advantage at that point for that. So, so you could say maybe more unsupervised, although not required, it could be also supervised. And here it will be more of a supervised, I have paired data. But sorry, I didn't mean that uh, language grounding is only semantic or only statistic. I meant you can do both, yeah. A good question, really good clarification. Okay, um, so what is the simplest way to ground elements? The simplest one is to look at it as a bag of elements. Like, like forget the structure that, that, that the word, uh, the sentence have words ordering or objects have a certain uh, posi relative spatial positioning. And just say there's two elements and I have paired data. Uh, so this is more the semantic one. So usually it, you, and when you have paired data, it's usually semantically a human annotated them. But it could be paired data just because in a Wikipedia, uh, it, I have weak alignment because uh, images and, and some sentences are on the same web page. Um, so it's a, it, it's a, it's, it's a weak, we will say weak supervision. So strong supervision means it's very clean. I, I, I tell you, um, strong pairs mean this is the element, the object, and this is its description. That's a strong pair. The, the weak uh, alignment will be like, uh, like I, I, I have an image on the Wikipedia page. I have a sentence or a noun phrase. There's a chance that they are linked, but there's a chance they're not. But there's probably a chance that one of the sentences is linked to that image. It's very rare that on Wikipedia they put image randomly. So that image must be linked to something, uh, but we don't know exactly. So that will be a weak pair, or you could say group-based uh, pairing would be another way. Um, some people will call it unsupervised, but I don't really like because it's, it, it, there is a supervision, it's just a weak one. It's just like, a, it's an approximate one. I prefer the limited supervision or weak supervision. Some paper would claim it's unsupervised because I'm just taking data from uh, Wikipedia. But if you think about it, there is a supervision, it's just a weak one. Uh, same way uh, you're watching video on YouTube, you're watching videos on YouTube um, and someone say a word, uh, and then you see an object on the video, like there's a chance that the person just talk about that object, but it's possible that they've been talking about something else. Um, now, if it's a news video, there's a good chance that the, what you see is related to the news, but uh, for other videos, it may be completely unrelated, like a music video or something, the lyrics don't match one-on-one. -on -one. So these are example of weak supervision. But for now, let's say you have strong supervision to make it easier. Strong supervision of this, how, based on the lecture uh, of uh, representation learning, how would you solve that problem? 
which kind of uh, represented fusion, coordination, or fission? What will you use? Coordination. That looks a lot like a coordination. So yes, you can learn a coordination. You can learn a, a similarity function um, um, because you have strong pair information. You can go ahead. Everything we've learned uh, in the previous lecture applies here. Um, in fact, if you have uh, the pair data, then you can also get your negative from it. Um, so everything we learn about contrastive learning can also allow you. So, so what it is, what do I do? I, with this pair of data, I'm learning space. I'm learning some kind of space where I, I'm emphasizing what is common to both. I'm, I'm learning. So I'm coordinating these two to be. So originally you have all of language, all of visual, but I'm slowly bringing them closer to each other. I'm bringing them so that what is common uh, is close. And so now if I, I want to do, after learning this, how do I go and do the alignment? I can go really exhaustively. That would be the exact, where give me uh, an object or give me a noun phrase, a noun phrase, and let me look at all the objects and let's look at which one is the closest to me. Uh, will be the simplest nearest neighbor, uh, kind of a nearest neighbor uh, on this. Um, and let me look at the next noun phrase and look at which one is the closest. Now it will not handle really well if the object is not there, uh, it will still like, uh, you'll still get a maximum. So you'll need to handle these situations uh, there. But it's a really valid way. And a lot of the early work on language grounding were using things like this. They were doing a uh, learning a space and then uh, thinking about uh, local alignment as an image retrieval problem, really, that's what this is. They are they're taking the alignment and they're transferring and saying, let me look at it as image retrieval. The, the query will be the noun phrase, and then all of the objects in the image are the possible one, and I'm retrieving the closest one from that. So um there is also uh when you look at language and vision how they're related to each other oh yeah 30 minutes you're also able to look at it as a directed alignment and it's directed um mostly because it's no more like here there's a there's an undirected similarity function between the two. I'm just generally trying to get them closer. It's mostly that it's, I have a query. There is one specific element and I'm looking at uh, all of the other elements to look at what this, uh, uh, um, what is the closest of the object. And the best example for that was for image captioning. When you do image captioning, that was one of the first time that uh, these kind of directed alignment were done. It's like, as I'm generating the caption, like, is this object related to every part of the image or only for a subset of it? Um, so the same idea that we discussed during representation, the idea of attention, now we're going to really take the full potential of that approach. And I'm going to show you a first way to do that. So, and I'm going to talk about two types of attention, the same two types we talked earlier, soft attention and hard attention. What's the advantage of soft attention? Okay, computing the gradient, computing the derivative will be much easier. Okay, it's often like a softmax over all objects present in it. While the hard attention, because it's almost a zero one, uh, uh, these will be a bit harder, often will require, I'm gonna show you one that doesn't require uh, reinforcement learning, but a lot of them will often require reinforcement learning uh, to be solved uh, correctly. So why, how do you use attention as part of image captioning. So a typical image captioning, the typical, like typical being, I don't know, 2014, uh, 2014 uh, typical uh, image captioning was you encode your image once. You encode your image once. 
to a CNN, let's say, now these days this would be a visual transformer. And if you remember, the CNN has all of this uh, spatial information at the beginning because you run your kernels, you get a response map, you do some pooling, you run some more kernels, pooling, more kernels, pooling. And then at the end, you still have like nice spatial information, but then you do a fully connected and lose all of your nice uh, facial information. And really at the end, you get just that encoding over the whole image, over the, the whole image. <laughs> so if you are to use that as a seed to your uh, generator, so this is, hey, this is all the information in the image. Now, this uh, representation can be used to generate uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the caption. So a woman is throwing. And if you remember, so what, there are two things that happen here, by the way. One, one thing is the language model, OK? If you remember, the beauty of a language model is to know to predict which word is most likely to come next, okay? So the word a woman is probably like coming nicely from uh, the image, but the word throwing, does it really come from the image? Maybe, maybe the uh, algorithm was so good at finding poses that recognize, but, because it's uh, a woman and it's, uh, I don't put it there, the word frisbee, it's really good at uh, blank, the, uh, filling the blank, okay? So the word throwing is most likely, um, my hypothesis, is not being written because uh, the woman was in that shape. It's probably there because a woman and a frisbee usually uh, is about throwing and like so as long as the woman was really not in a shape so it's probably it's never completely one or completely the other is it is it just the language model that gave me all that information or is it really just the image that gave me all that information? it's a mix of both but if you ask me like uh or is these are definitely there because of the language this is like 95% certain this is the language model that just decided that a good sentence grammatically will be there. But the word throwing is probably a mix of both. But when deciding about the word throwing, you or the word woman or the word frisbee, you right now use only one embedding, the same one for all, uh, all words is going to be used over and over there. So could you, should we always use that? And that's the idea of directed alignment or attention is that we're, we're instead of taking, you remember a response map pooling, response map pooling. And at that stage, just before you do the fully connected, you have that magic moment where you have a lot of information in each of those uh, response because you took the pooling and so it's relatively compact. You took the big image and bring it, but you still have spatial information there. So instead of using the CNN output, uh, the fully connected version, you're gonna use the last layer of convolution. That's what I picked, depicted here. Let's say the last one is a three by three. Usually it's 16 by 16, the last one. And then when I'm about to uh, decode, uh, often what I will do is I will, before even I start like thinking, okay, what should be the first word? I will reflect and look at all of these different patches of the image and say, which one is most relevant to the word I'm about to generate? Like which information is the most relevant? And then I will look at all these patches and I will create a gate. So this is a gate here, like an attention gate. An attention gate. Uh, and an attention gate, what is, if this is 16 by 16, how many attention weights do I have? If, if the last layer here is 16 by 16, 
So the attention will also be 16 by 16, okay? So you will have one attention weight for each patch, telling me how important that patch in the image, which could be seen like one patch here, one patch here, one patch here, which of these are the most useful? And then I will just do a weighted average and that would give my embedding. So this is, instead of taking the last layer of the neural network, I came back and do a weighted average of those patches and then give me an embedding. And then that tells me, okay, that's what's useful to generate the words. Let me detect the words and then recompute a new attention. Okay, now that I created the first word like uh, where should I attend in the image next? So now dynamically, I'm going to decide of a new set of weights. And that new set of weights will decide to me, okay, this is this part of the image that is most important. Let me generate the words like this. Now, this is the old way of doing attention. This is the old way. Now the new way, instead of taking that last layer of a CNN, what we do these days is you have a list of objects. You have a list of objects and the number of attention weight is going to be the same number as the number of objects in the image right now. Okay, so the new way to do it or new way, like, I don't know, five years uh, is to not look at just the CNN all patches, but to look at the list of objects. So when I encode um, the next word, Right now, I was using the, uh, previously I was using the same encoding of the image at every time I generate the word. Now I will have this uh, new way of, like here's the image. And if you could focus on this part of the image first, then this part of the image, then this part of the image. So you have a different embedding. So you're taking all the different patches of the image. Each of them has its own weight. And, and you have a gate, so there is a nice gate, and, and this was, will be learned with a neural network, a one-layer neural network. A simple one-layer neural network will learn to output those uh, attention weights. And so let me show it visually, sometimes it's better. So here's, as you see, so uh, this is just, I don't know, like probably, the, but woman, that makes sense, is not as throwing, Frisbee in the park, and then it pick up the park. So you can see that it's not perfect because it should know that some of them are not even like in the image. And that's why you can see also the effect of the language model at that phase, but it does pick up a lot of the right. And that was a really cool, like uh, another aha moment. Uh, the previous one, the year before there was, uh, uh, the same thing had been done in machine translation. Uh, the, the, first, the first one was machine translation, and then we see that. So uh, this is soft attention because uh, soft attention, because the whole image or all the list of objects, you have a soft attention weight for each. But what if I want to have, I, I, I know there's only one object I would like to focus on, on one region I would like to focus on. And I, I like, so there is two different ways. One, it would be reinforcement learning. The other one, which is a little bit similar, not exactly, is to say, hey, let me just in, uh, imagine the magnifier and let me go around it and try to find where in the image I want to. So I'm going to iteratively try to find what is the right spot to, to go. So the idea here is I have my image and then I have a location, which is X and Y, X and Y location in the image. And I will randomly initialize it, randomly initialize it. And then I will take the uh, location and the image, and I will do two things. I will encode what do I see at that location. And I will also just encode the location itself together. And then I will just have a recurrent neural network which are just a simple, you can imagine a one layer neural network that will just decide what is the next location I should look at. So here's, I'm in the image, I'm right here. And I'm like, hey, is it the right place to be? And then I encode it and I, I encode my location itself. And then I run it to one neural network and it says, hey, why don't you go a little bit on the left? 
And so, oh, okay. And then I go on the left and then I do again and I do iterate until finally I find the, the direction of location I want. Um, this is an example of a hard attention and you could imagine a little bit, it has a flavor of reinforcement learning into that. So these are local alignments. You're aligning locally or, but what is really interesting and I think, and that's gonna be the focus one of the main things for this lecture today is to do global alignment. It's no more that you're aligning one element with the other. You really want to take, okay, I have all these words and I have all these objects. And let me, when I decide to link this word with this object, I should be aware that there was also this other word that I could have selected. And really I'm trade-off. There's always a trade-off. And I should be, if I end up linking this word with this object, then this other word will not be able to be linked maybe also to the same object. So the uh, pairing information in this case, often uh, it could be that I have supervised data, like I have strong pairs, but here often this kind of global alignment will also be used when I have weak alignment. I have weak alignment. I only know that some of these words are aligned with some of these objects, but I don't know exactly uh, what it is. Or I, I don't have it directly, the alignment, but maybe I have a, a downstream task that will give me some information about the pairing. But I wanna do it that globally. So what I really wanna do is two things. I wanna do representation, which is the local alignment. But I also want to do the global alignment together. And the link between the two are this uh, distance or similarity function. Okay, so this is really important. So this is going to give me some similarity function. So this is the kind of local alignment. But at the same time, I'm using those similarity function to find the optimal way of aligning them. So it's a mix of both at the same time. This part we discuss a lot, so I don't need to discuss like, uh, like uh, it could be coordination or could be contrastive, uh, but let's say it's a coordination function or similarity function. Let's talk about the global alignment. So I'm going to present two approaches, okay? And they're a little bit, um, um, they're either you see them as complex or simple, depending on how often you work with linear programming. Um, so either it's really simple to you or it's very complex. Um, but the main, main problem that I have when I do global alignment is you could phrase it as what's called assignment problem. And by the way, um, so assignment problem is a special case of something where I'm gonna talk about in a second, which is um, a transport, um, uh, um, um, Ah, what, what's the transport? Um, yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, just a second. Optimal transport. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, assignment uh, problem is a special case of optimal transport, which is a special case of linear programming. So, when you he hear these terms, like, and there's also a network flow in the middle. So, so linear programming is kind of the most generic version. Uh, and then uh, and then you make it a little bit more constrained, uh, the network flow, then a little bit more constrained, the optimal flow. And I'm starting with the simplest one, assignment problem. But I, I'm, I'm going to build to the more complex. But the, the simplest one is assignment problem. Assignment problem is I have two, a graph, but it's a bipart graph, okay? What is the bipart? Let's say I have two modalities. Uh, you could pre make it tripart eventually, but like, let's say for now it's a bipart. And so it's a graph like that elements on one modality and then elements on the other. So this, this is given. I have this list of elements on A, though you could call them nodes. A list of elements on B, you could call them nodes. And the edges can only happen between elements of two modalities and associated with uh, each edge is a similarity function that I have as well. And as you know, this is going to be either pre-trained 
either you pre-trained it in the local alignment or it's jointly trained as, as it can be done also. So let's make the simplest case. I have two modalities, okay? So a list of words or noun phrases and a list of objects, okay? And let's say for now that there's a one-to-one -one matching between them, okay? That there is always a hard assignment from a noun phrase to an object, okay? A noun phrase to an object. And all elements for that now, all, all words are gonna be assigned to one uh, object. If you want to make it more general, you could put a bunch of dummy objects if you wanted and say, let's say that you have more words than you have objects. You could also create dummy objects uh, and that will allow you to still use that approach. Or the other way around, you could have dummy words, like uh, words that are just there. Um, and because you know that some of the objects are gonna be not linked to the uh, words. But some now, for, for now, simple. I have a list, let's say of three words, and I have three objects, and I want to do the one-to-one -one mapping. So you can see why it's a simpler case of what will be the harder uh, cases as you go uh, along. But it's still an interesting case. So um, the assignment, what is going to be the assignment function? It's only a vector, OK? You, could, you can simplify that assignment by a vector of indices. I have three objects, uh, and I have three words. So I could have a simple, uh, uh, so you take the word, the, the numbers one, two, and three, and permit permutation of one, two, three, and that gives you the space. All the permutation of one, two, three gives you the space of these assignments, okay? So just to make it simple. So now there is a similarity weight and uh, assignment problem is often seen in a somewhat directed way. Although at the core it is uh, symmetric, but it's often defined in a directed way. What it means is that I, I take the weight of one uh, specific of, uh, word within this I, okay? Which is associated embedding I from modality A. And then I, I randomly, let's say for now, I just did it randomly, the assignment, the one, two, three. And I, I, I take that in this index, index, which let's say index three, and run it to my uh, assignment. So I run it to it, and that gives me a new index that tells me, oh, why don't you try this one? And then I take that index, get its uh, embedding, and then I, I have my uh, similarity function that gives me the weight. So if I have a randomly assigned, assignment of my three to the three others on the other side. That gives me how many weights? Three, okay? And so if I wanna know if this is good assignment, then really what I wanna try is all possible permutation. And if there's only three of them, it's easy to do. So I try all possible to permutation of three all possible permutation, and just look at the weights I would get from that permutation, okay? So when I solve it, the simplest way is to check all assignment. And, and, and I tried all possible permutation, and one of them will be the maximum, it, it, depending if the, it's a similarity function or a cost function. So it's a similarity function, it's a maximum. If it's a cost function or a loss function, then it's a minimum. So, but for now, let's call it a maximum. So as you can imagine, um, people have worked very hard trying to make this uh, more efficient. Um, and I will invite you to look, there's some uh, established way to make uh, this uh, more efficient. And, and instead of being, uh, I don't know, N square or something like this to have it more polynomial time, um, 
or like um, I forgot the, the best of the best. But what uh, what people will do often, and not polynomial, that was not the right one, right, right? but what people will do is they're kind of not lazy, but they're like, hey, I have all this really cool code for linear programming. And I know linear programming is an overkill because it's able to solve like millions of harder problems than what you like simple problem that you have here. But if you take that simple problem and put it in the same format as a linear program will look like, then yeah, I have very well established solvers for that and very efficient for that. Uh, so what people will often do is take this, there are algorithms just to solve this efficiently, but what most people will do is take that problem, bring it into a linear program and then solve it. So how do you take this and bring it in a linear program? It, it's a little bit of just uh, changing a little bit uh, all these three things here. Um, so instead of, of being uh, a, a vector of indices that, that align, uh, so one, uh, two, and three, and all the permutations, I'm going to represent it as almost of a matrix, uh, almost of a matrix of all possible assignment, but it's a zero one. Um, so, uh, so it's one, um, it's going to be one if there is an edge between, so the I index and the J index. And so this, if there's like three by three, so it's going to be a three by three kind of matrix. Uh, but this, this is in fact your parameter you're going to optimize. This is what you're trying to find. Okay, so this is uh, the linear program. What it will try to find is which of the ij is going to be uh, um, active or not. Um, so that's the uh, variable you're going to look for, xij. Um, and then the weights, it, it's slightly different, but it's, it, it's almost the same. It's just that uh, for each index i, each index j, I'm going to define that same matrix. So there is kind of a matrix of parameters that could be zero or one. And that's what, the, what I'm optimizing, like which one are active or not. That's what the linear program is going to try to do. And I have for each of those X, I'm going to have a weight associated to it, which is computed from uh, the embeddings of each of this and this. And then what I maximize is this, is, is a, in a sense a simple one is like take uh, every one that is active, every edge that is active, okay, uh, every edge is active, and just sum its weight. Now to make it full program, I just realized I, I, there's a few things I didn't write up yet. Why it's called a linear program because it's going to say it's it's subject. Uh, to a bunch of constraints, um, and 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 the constraints is going to be, for example, that your x i j uh, it has to be uh, zero and one, but also x i j has to be an integer, an integer. So it's kind of a funny way to write it down. Like instead of saying, "Hey, be zero or one." The way of writing it as a linear program is to say, I want x, i, j to be between zero and one, but I want it to be part of that space of an integer. Um, it's kind of a, a convoluted way to, to do that. And, and then you will also put another constraint um, where uh, you want i um, only, uh, uh, you will also put a constraint that uh, only one i can be connected to a j. Like you will also put a constraint in such a way that um, you don't want like, uh, if, um, unless you want to have multiple connection, but usually these assignment problem says only this circle can only be connected to one of these uh, 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 triangle. So you will also put a constraint about uh, I being, um, I, I, I have to, I, I, I would not write it down, but I can, I can send a note uh, later. Uh, I thought I had put it on the slide, but then I, I just realized I'm missing one slide. So, but yeah, you will add another constraint that says, hey, 
this, uh, for any of the J, it can only be, only one of the X can be active. Only one of the I, I can be active, only one of the I. So this is a linear program. A linear program is made usually of three parts. Uh, it's, it's, it's your, uh, the thing you optimize, the boundary you put on each of your variables, and those constraint about the I and the J and the value it can take, like in this case, being element of A and being element of B. So I being, a, a J being an element of I. So these are the other constraints. So there's three parts to it. There's uh, the maximum. There is the uh, boundary of your, of your variable and then some other constraint that you add. And then there's this algorithm which I'm not gonna try to explain today, which nicely optimizes it as a simplex. So if you put, if you go through this whole trouble of taking what looks really simple to me originally, and you're kind of making it in a somewhat more convoluted, but if you do that, then now there's a really fast way to optimize it. And that's with the nice beauty of the linear programming and that. Um, so this is the assignment problem, uh, but, this is the symbol of the assignment problem. You may want to also think of it as a little bit more complex version of it because in this version, this was a hard assignment. Uh, a word can only be connected to one object, but in reality, a word could be connected to more than one object. If I say people or students, I mean, there's, I don't know how many of you right now, but like, is that the 88 students? So, um, so now what I will do is I will do more of a soft assignment. So I told you assignment problem, it's the simplest. Optimal transport, a little bit more complex, that's what it is. Um, and um, when you really go to the other more complex is often they will be, uh, they will be uh, on full graph, not on just bipart graphs. Um, uh, but yeah, so optimal transport is a little bit more complex. And what it allows is allows many to many kind of alignments. That's really cool. So now it's gonna be kind of a soft alignment between all my object and my, all my words and all of my object. Uh, now we have uh, 30 minutes. Um, different number of elements also. So before you had it, it had to be like about the same number uh, and the same distribution on, on both sides, like three object, three object. Now it can be any. Um, and so, and why it's called optimal transport? Because in 1768, someone looked at, hey, how do I move earth or dirt from one place to another? And they thought this would be an amazing mathematical problem to work. Uh, so they were like, okay, how do I move dirt from that place to that place? Um, uh, and, and is there like a transportation map that goes from one to the other? It's really cool. But then in the in 1950s, uh, that same concept was taken again by an economist that look at it, um, not just as moving dirt, but really looking at how do these two things are coupling to each other. It's called the coup, I forget his name, um, uh, relaxation. There is someone who took that original problem from the seven, uh, 1800 and, and, and like made it into economy. And but it was a relaxation because it, the original one was a directed one. You go and you transport to the other. The relaxation, it makes it more of a symmetric one. Uh, how are these coupled together? And that's the one I'm gonna present today is the relaxation. That's the one most people would use, but we keep the term optimal transport. It's about transporting dirt from one place to another. Um, but let me formalize it. So uh, the formalization is that you will also have a variable because at the end of the day, optimal transport, is also a special case of linear programming. So my goal is still to put it in a, a same kind of format as a linear program. So I'm, I'm gonna on purpose set for each edge, I'm gonna define a variable 
that, but this one is going to be a soft assignment. Okay, so um, if it's one, it means like, uh, and, and there will be usually constraint that it's sum to one. So like, like the, so that for a specific um, uh, element, if I look at all of its edges, like four edges, the weights of those four edges should be equal to one, or it should be to be the real, real thing. It should be equal to the weight of that original object. I'm transporting that object in there. Okay. So, uh, so, but for now, it was much easier to think about. Is let's make think about it as summing to one. So this is really about summing to one. All of these weights should be equal to one. Um, and for this one, all of these uh, weights should be equal to one. So this would be a constraint. Uh, uh, this would be sorry, a constraint that you would put on, on, your, uh, on your X. And then the similarity weights are the same one as we defined before, because they come uh, for each link. I have uh, a weight uh, which is how similar. And then the optimization looks a lot like the previous one, in fact. Uh, so right here, the main difference is now, in a sense, the only is, is I put different set of constraints um, uh, on my X. I, in fact, I made it uh, simpler. I relaxed a little bit the constraints. I, I didn't say, oh, it's a hard assignment. I didn't, I, I don't have, um, I, I don't have uh, these things anymore. Uh, I, I, Yes, XIJ still need to do, and if I sum over all of the I um, of the XIJ, it should be equal to one. So I will have some new uh, constraint like this. Um, to be exact, it, it would be to the weight of that original uh, sample. But in in practice, let's say let's say that we normalize our data, then. It's 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 all equal to one. So I will I will want all the um, I, and similarly for the J also I will want all of them to equal to one. So I have a slightly different set of of, of constraints, but now I can optimize all at once all of these to globally know what is. And um, I was debating to put it in this lecture or not. Uh, but I, if you're interested on this topic and you hear that like Wasserstein and like it makes a, a NIRIPS paper get accepted because you use Wasserstein this science. Um, so, um, but it, it is a really cool uh, metric because it, it does have a direct link. Uh, whoops, sorry. And, and, and optimal transport can often be defined with that distance. So to optimize it, and you use that distance as a metric, then uh, it helps with the optimization of this. So if you hear optimal transport and Wasserstein, they are related to each other. I'm not gonna go into detail with this uh, today uh, because it got a little bit beyond the, the purpose of the multimodal, uh, but just to know as a side note. But the main thing to know is optimal transport sounds like kind of a real name for soft assignment. I would have been a much better one, like. A soft uh, global alignment would have been a great way to call it, um, but uh, historically, and it's hard to, uh, someone did it uh, 300 years ago. So. Um, so the last part of today is about continuous alignment. Uh, so it's not just about um, uh, discrete, but in many cases, when you have speech or others, is that you often have continuous uh, signal and you have to deal with this. Um, and so how do you deal with this? And there is at least two approaches or there, again, a spectrum of it, but at least two families. One is if you have signals and you have two signals, then instead of trying to create and discretize it, you can just try to warp them from one signal to another, to, to synchronize them, to warp or synchronize the signal, to align them continuously. Um, or the other approach is to take something that's continuous and you discretize it, you segment it, you, you're learning a dictionary of elements uh, on it. And once you've got your elements, then you're back 
to the a discrete version. So then everything that we talk about with the discrete can work once you've done the discretization. Um, so the warping, I would say there's quite a bit of work, but there's kind of one approach that you kind of have to know in, in this. And that's the one I will share. And then and after that, there's just a lot of extension to it, but there's one primarily I want. And so anybody has aligned two signals in the past and what do you use for this? Oh, okay, maybe not then. Okay, good. Dynamic time warping is the uh, DCW will be the like the one one that you would do. So let's say I have video of me kicking a ball uh, and someone else kicking a ball or maybe from a different modality, the same motion, but it's not exactly the same frame rate or there may be some misalignment. So I want to align each element. So, so it's a, in a sense, it is a little bit discrete, but it's so fine grain that it, 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 it's, it's that level of alignment will be uh, quite uh, uh, demanding. So if I have those two signals and I want to align them, so I have X, uh, my first signal, and then Y, my second signal, and I want to temporarily align it. The idea here, and there's different formulation, I'm going to present two formulation of DCW. The, the first formulation is find for each of the X, for each of the X, so for the length, let's say, and the length of these doesn't need to be the same, okay? So the NAN X and NYs are different, NX and NYs are different. So for each of my element X, tell me which index, um, the, which index it connects on the Y, and for each of the Y, which index it connects to the X. So it's a, a two-way thing. So usually what you will do is these index will take the longest of the two. You will take the longest and, 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 and that's what you will use. So the, in this case, you can say that, okay, um, my goal, my, my, uh, what am I optimizing for are those indices. I don't know those indices. That's what I'm optimizing for. Um, and to do this, uh, dynamic time warping, uh, will uh, use, in fact, something similar to linear programming called dynamic programming, because really what it is, is that as I'm finding, what, one of the things that makes this problem feasible is that uh, this point here is never going to be connected to this one. Or if it is, then all of the others have to be connected uh, like previously to the same one. So like there's kind of a, there's not crossover. So it's a simple, it's, it's, it's a synchronization. I'm, I'm supposed that there is a sequence and the only thing that's different is that someone has been slowed down or faster. So the only difference is that something has been slowed down or something has been faster, but there's no long range dependency that cross over. So it's a simpler problem. So I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not allowing this, or let's say this one to be connected to the other. There is a normal, con so you could say there's a mon monotonicity. So you're not going back in time. And there's a continuity in the gap. And there's kind of a boundary of the start and the same point. So the space is constrained. So it's, it's like all possible paths. And that's why I'm saying it's a lot like linear programming, because what really linear programming was trying, in a sense, if you remember doing a alignment, the alignment, you had all these possible n by n alignments, and it's just going to try all possible alignments, all possible paths. So the same kind of approach can also be approached to use there. So the uh, formulation of these points can also put in a matrix, and that is a lot closer to what we know. Um, so here, without changing really the problem, but just replicating, every time there is more than one point connected to the same point, I'm just going to replicate it, the same point. And I will allow, by doing that, I just take, it's kind of an easy thing. I just uh, replicate the, uh, so I have my X matrix, and I can allow replication. And that allows me this matrix to put now in this nice weight matrix formulation, 
Uh, that's the one we love very much. So it's no more about indices, but it's about weights. And when you do that, then you can revisit um, uh, because here the problem for this version is that it only works if my uh, two signals have the same dimensions, the same size, or are in the same modality. But if I have multimodal data, what are the ways we talk about for fusion? One of the approach for fusion uh, is to learn a new embedding where the data is correlated. So you can take the same canonical correlation analysis, put it also in the same, so you remember you're learning and embedding in each modality in such a way that these uh, are as correlated as possible. And if you remember, it's more than just correlation, it's canonical correlation. So you have more than one way that this data is correlated. And so you can take this nice correlation loss and bring it with the two, so it's called uh, canonical time warping. So you do two things at the same time. You, you have the weights that decide to assign certain elements to certain other elements, but at the same time you do representation learning with the U and the V that learns an embedding where the data is as correlated as possible. So you do both alignment and representation in the same, and how do you optimize it? It's a chicken and an egg uh, problem. You, you, you will uh, freeze the representation for a second and optimize for the alignment. And then you will freeze the alignment and optimize for the uh, representation and go back and forth between them. Um, I just want to show uh, two more examples. So the other one uh, for alignment that's really interesting is called temporal consistency. Let's say you have the same idea, two videos or two sequences, and you want to align them. Um, here, the, uh, to align it together, the intuition that you will get is that if I, if I believe that you're the closest to me, let's say it's one sequence and there's another sequence, and I believe that you're the closest to me, then you should also believe that you're the closest to me. I want, I want to, both of us to believe that we are the closest neighbor to each other. Um, so the idea here is you have one sequence, you have another sequence, and then you will want a, a, a consistency, meaning that if I ask you, all of them, hey, if I ask you which one is your closest neighbor and you think it's this one, then if I ask this one, which one is your closest neighbor, it should also think that is the same. So to do this, the way it works is that you will train an encoder. If it's multimodal, you have two encoders, one for each modality. And from there, you will do a two-step thing. You will say, okay, for this element, find which one you think is the closest to you and find that soft, closest uh, neighbors. Now take that soft closest neighbor. It could be a hard one. And that could have been a hard match also. The, you could have said, hey, I want you to find the closest neighbor uh, and you, you would have been forced to do one. But here it's kind of a weighted average of them. And that's kind of a virtual neighbor. It's kind of an average between these two probably. And then go and look back and say, hey, which one do you think is your closest neighbor? And finally, if it's not me, if you're like, hey, you thought this was the closest neighbor, then you go back and you say, no, this is wrong. And that's how you propagate your gradient after that. That's the wrong, that's your loss function, is that you, you got a distance between who I thought you, uh, you should have thought it was and finally the one you selected instead. Um, the last section of it is about discretization. So you take your modality, you take uh, uh, your signal, and instead of trying to warp them, you can decide to just take that modality and discretize it. Um, and so, uh, because if you remember, uh, many images, like images these days are a list of objects. But how do you do this, like if it's a single or medical imaging, like you have voxels of fMRI, 
how do you get those entities? So um, there is two approaches. One is the supervised learning, which is kind of a top down. Like, like if you know that there, if you can get annotations, if you can get annotations of those clusters, really what it is, this is about kind of a clustering. So, so one approach, and that's the one that's using computer vision, is that someone manually annotated, annotated the clusters, the objects, and they created a really large data set, ImageNet. Uh, and the other approach in speech was to say, hey, I'm going to manually annotate phonemes. And so, and so I, I'm going to have you uh, learn a mapping between very small uh, audio frames to the phonemes. It's a surprise learning way. The problem is a, it's a many to one uh, uh, mapping. It's a many to one mapping. And so the many to one mapping will make this a little bit harder problem. So this is why people, what they did is they take the every frame of your frame and do a prediction of which phoneme it is. But let's say there's like thousands of audio frames then because I know there's consistency in phonemes, it's very rare that I go from one phoneme, the next audio frame to a completely different phoneme and a complete one, there should be some consistency. And so that's why it's called temporal consistency or connection is, is that I will look at all of those predictions for the, all the different phonemes. I will also add an option for no phonemes. And then I will look at all the different paths you remember uh, linear programming? It has a flavor of that. You're going to look at all different paths of, of this, but I'm going to put some constraints, a little bit like we've done, saying, hey, phonemes, they don't change that often. In fact, I want to expect you to be kind of consistent, and I will nicely optimize that. And finally, I know it's a lot of information for today. This is the last one. That is the last way. You're gonna have like this night tonight. <laughs> uh, but this is kind of a mini preview to the, ne the lecture of, uh, for next week on the transformers. Uh, this is kind of a mini preview to that. And, and the, this is the hidden bird, which uh, as a side note, uh, one of the co-author was named Hubert also, uh, one of the uh, students. So, um, so yeah, Hubert, um, the idea here is that I have all these audio clips and what will I do is I'm gonna cluster them. In fact, most of the discretization is either manually labeled or clustering. That's usually one or the other. But the nice thing here is that I'm gonna cluster my data and then for every segment, I'm gonna say which cluster it is part of. And the nice thing is that I'm going to learn, and we'll talk more about it next week, I'm going to learn a model that predicts an, uh, an, uh, an embedding, like it encodes each of these segments in such a way that it's able to predict correctly the cluster it's supposed to be in. So I'm going to mask. You remember the masking when we talk about uh, uh, distributional hypothesis. The idea is that even though I don't have it as an input, the other audio segment should be able to predict the cluster. So I'm going to force this uh, model to be really good at predicting a representation that allows me to predict the clusters. So the, but the main take home is the clustering part. And this part here, I'm going to discuss a lot more in details in the next lecture. So don't worry about the exact learning part. But the main part idea is that either you learn the, the, the discretization because you got human annotation, or you end up clustering your data um, and use that. So um, next week, uh, we'll talk about taking alignment and mixing it with representation to look at those self-attention uh, transformer one. So thank you very much.